I've got a confession to make. I've been using TrueNAS Core and Scale for a while now, but if you ask me exactly which VDEV layout would produce the best pool performance, I honestly wouldn't know. And the thing is, I'm betting you couldn't tell me either. Why? Because it's hard, that's why. I've built different pools using different layouts and haven't seen much of a difference in performance, which has left me with more questions than answers, and I think it's time we fix that. Welcome home lobbers and self-hosters, Rich here, and in this video, we're going on a journey. I'm gonna build a bunch of different VDEV layouts, test them using Crystal Dismark over SMB, see what the performance differences are between them, and hopefully, once and for all, discover which VDEV layouts are the best for your NAS. Let's get to it. OpenZFS has a variety of different VDEV types that you can combine to create your storage pool. For many of you watching this video, you might not be totally familiar with the different types, so let's run through them. First, let's talk about data VDEVs. Data VDEVs are where you store your data. Within a data VDEV, you can specify no less than five different layouts, depending on the number of disks you assign to it. You can create stripes, mirrors, a RAID Z1, which is akin to a RAID 5 array, a RAID Z2, which is akin to a RAID 6 array, and a RAID Z3, which really doesn't have a traditional RAID equivalent. All of the RAID Z numbers denote how many disks you can lose at a time and have your data be safe. A single disk for RAID Z1, two disks for a RAID Z2, and you guessed it, three disks for a RAID Z3. And if that wasn't complicated enough, a pool can have multiple data VDEVs in it. Next, let's talk about cache VDEVs. A cache VDEV, also known as an L2 arc read cache, is used to accelerate read operations. Conceptually, a read cache holds onto frequently accessed data to help speed up access to bits stored on slower spinning disks. You can only have one read cache per pool. Now let's talk about log VDEVs. Log VDEVs, also known as a write cache, are meant to cache synchronous writes coming into your NAS and commit them back to the slower disks over time. The idea is pretty simple. If you have big slow disks in your storage, having a write cache would increase the speed at which you can write data to your storage system by caching those writes, and then in the background, the system can write the data back to slower storage. And log VDEVs have two different disk layout options. There are more types of VDEVs as well, like metadata VDEVs and dedupe VDEVs, but we're going to focus on the big three. We have in our possession the newest TrueNAS Mini R from iX, which we reviewed recently, so check that out if you haven't seen it yet. It's the perfect platform for me to test different VDEV layouts to see which one produces the best storage performance. Let's talk about the hardware first. As mentioned, we'll be using the brand new TrueNAS Mini R from iX Systems. This awesome NAS rocks 12 3.5 inch 6 gig hot swap drive bays, 64 gigs of RAM, and has dual 10 gig Ethernet. Our Mini R is running TrueNAS scale and is the perfect test bench for this exercise. Let's talk about storage. Our storage consists of eight 10 terabyte Western Digital Red Plus NAS drives and four 1.9 terabyte iX branded SSDs. We'll be combining these drives in a variety of different VDEV combinations to see how well each configuration performs and how much effective storage we'll get from each configuration. There are so many possible combinations to test, they decided to break it down into four data VDEV layouts, each with three different groups of tests. One with just data VDEVs alone, then a test with just a mirrored write cache, and lastly, a test with a mirrored write cache and a read cache. Testing these different layouts should show us what the effects different layouts have on SMB performance. You ready to look at some graphs? Let's get to the data. Before I show you the graphs and talk about the details, I want to talk about the sheer amount of testing I did prior to making the video. This video would be super long and boring if I went into every single test result, so I'm only going to summarize the best performing tests here for the sake of your sanity and mine. If you want to see the raw results of my testing, let me know in the comments and I can put the spreadsheets up on Google Sheets for you hardcore data people. Okay, first let's compare the four pool layouts that only consist of data VDEVs to each other to see if there's a performance difference between data VDEV layouts. As a reminder, the first pool layout is four sets of mirrored 10 terabyte disks, with the other pool layouts being variations of a single RAID Z1, 2, and 3 that are comprised of a single 8 disk VDEV. Right away, we can see that for the 4x mirrored data VDEV layout, there is a benefit to disk writes. But surprisingly, there is absolutely no difference in read performance for any data VDEV pool layout, regardless of type, and for the most part, very little to no performance difference for write operations outside of the 4x mirrored layout. All right, so we have our baseline. From this point, we should be able to see what impact having read and write caches does to our performance. Let's take a look. In these tests, we've added a 4x mirror write cache to each data VDEV layout. Why a 4x mirror, you ask? One, because we have the disks, and two, that should provide the best possible performance for a write cache. 
These results are kind of shocking to me. I expected to see a massive boost in write speeds for all data VDEV layouts because we added a write cache. But in reality, having a write cache seems to have hurt every layout's write performance to the tune of around 30 to 60 megabytes a second. Now let's move on to the read and write cache test results. With the addition of a read cache and write cache to our data VDEVs, we essentially see the same results as we saw with the additional write cache only. All these numbers are basically within the same margin of error throughout all tests. What is going on here? Those numbers are basically all the same regardless of display layout or whether they have read or write caches. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I would expect that when you add caches that at least we'd see some performance improvements over pools without them, or what would be the value of having them in the first place. Clearly, I don't fully grasp what's going on here. And what do you do when you don't know the answer to something? You get a hold of an expert. This is Chris Paradon, Technical Marketing Engineer at iX Systems. Chris, Thank you so much for taking the time to answer my questions. Thanks for having me on the show, Rich. Anytime. So I'll get right to it. I sent you the results ahead of time. And the, the burning question I have to ask right off the top here is, why are my results so similar? So your results were similar because what you're seeing happen here is ZFS caching is kicking in, both on your reads and your write tests. So uh, when you've got the reads going on, you've got what what's called the adaptive read cache in ZFS. So that's storing a mix of the recently and the frequently used data in RAM. Since your benchmark for a lot of those cases was under the 64 gigs of RAM that you have in your mini R, uh, most of that file was coming straight off of RAM speeds. So when you were doing those one meg size read tests, it was basically benchmarking just how fast we can read your RAM over the network. When we got to the smaller 4K block sizes, we were looking at more of a network latency benchmark there, basically how fast you can send from your client back to the true NAS machine and it would give you an accurate reply. So that covers your read side of the benchmarks. On the write side, uh, ZFS is actually gathering up pending writes into RAM. So there's been a lot of discussion that goes on about how ZFS buffers up to five seconds before it writes. Um, it's not 100% accurate. It will wait for up to five seconds to write unless something makes it write sooner. So there's a limit to how much pending data can pile up before a write happens. In the way your mini R was set up using scale out of the box, that number's a little under a gig. So that's why you saw sort of that dip happen right around there. Uh, if we reran those tests with a larger data set, if you push it up to uh, 128 to 56 gigs or even like a terabyte, then we'd start to flesh out some of the differences in those underlying VDEV layouts and the difference between mirrors and rates. So then I guess my next natural question would be, so where do caching VDEVs actually make sense to deploy? So when we're talking about a caching VDEV, if we talk about the read cache VDEV, that's useful when you have more hot data. So data that you're reading more than once or twice, uh, then you have RAM in the system. So in this case, if we raised your test data set up to 256 gigabytes, that's more than you have RAM in your mini R. So you would start to see some benefits of having the read cache there. Uh, good examples of that would be if you're using it for virtualization, if you've got it as a corporate file server and you don't necessarily have all of the RAM available to cache it, uh, but your, your second level would be it's coming off of SSD instead of reaching down to your hard drives. Um, for somebody's home media server, for example, if they're just running Plex, um, they've got a few of their CDs or DVDs stored on their uh, TrueNAS machine, they're not gonna see a big benefit from L2 because you don't typically watch the same movie over and over, unless like me, maybe you've got some small children in the house and they just love watching the same shows or listening to the same music. Um, the right side of things, which is called the, the log device, sometimes called the right cache, um, it's also a little bit misunderstood. So for SMB by default, the write cache isn't going to be in that data path at all. Um, Windows writes to SMB in an asynchronous fashion. It's going to hand over that data and basically tell TrueNAS, hey, whenever you've got a chance to put this onto disks, go right ahead. So ZFS will happily queue that up in RAM and spin it out to your backend drives as it gets a chance. A log device is gonna benefit you if you're doing an NFS share, if you're doing virtualization, something like that that says, I need you to commit this to stable storage and I will not proceed any further in my side until you tell me with 100% assurance it's there. That's what the log device is for because when you do a write like that, if it's a database, uh, if you're doing a financial transaction or if you're running a virtual machine where it says, um, I need to be 100% positive this data landed on a stable disk, that's where it's going to be written to RAM and it's going to be copied into that separate log device, the slug. Um, that's that's what's going to hit you the hardest for random IO. 
Um, because random I.O. on a hard drive is slow. We all know that. Um, anybody who's put a solid state drive in their desktop computer has seen the massive difference between random I.O. on a hard drive and a solid state. So for a slog device, you're going to want to add a really fast SSD. That's going to benefit you for your virtualization and your NFS use cases. Awesome. Okay. Then that makes a lot of sense. So naturally, then I guess the next question would be, since it's clear that RAM and ZFS are very port important and ZFS prefers RAM or uses RAM first before using any sort of caching, what's the sweet spot for RAM in a the system then? Uh, how many slots do you have and how big can you fill them? Um, <laughs> there isn't generally a maximum amount. That's the first thing. When somebody says, I want my system to go faster, I will say, can you fit more RAM in it? And that's often the first question. Uh, ZFS is gonna use all the RAM that you throw at it. There's been a lot of minimum guidelines that have come up over the years. There's been talk of eight gigs for minimum, uh, a one gig per one terabyte, yeah, mostly it's coming down to the performance you're after for your workload. Um, if you're just using it for backup of the occasional files, uh, you're not reading too heavily for it, or you're okay with the level of reads that you get from the disk, uh, such as again, in that sort of media streaming situation, you could have you know uh, 16 gigs of RAM for a couple terabytes of usable space, even a few dozen, and you wouldn't feel any real perceptible difference. Um, when you're doing latency sensitive workloads, again, if we're going back to VMs or NFS or transactional databases, that's where you're going to be looking at the, the other side of that, where you're going to have hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. You might just have a couple terabytes of usable space, but you want to serve as much of those reads as possible out of that RAM cache. So that's where you get into numbers like you'll see in our TrueNAS Enterprise hardware, where we're putting half a terabyte or more of RAM into some of these systems. So let me ask you a couple scenarios here, because it sounds like uh, there's uh, like in my case, the way I was perceiving caching is really dependent on the type of workloads I'm feeding the, uh, my my NAS. So um, we'll start with a, kind of a block of three. So first would be what sort of VDEV layout would you recommend for SMB solely, just like straight SMB network shares, followed by, say, um, just solely NFS network shares and then you know, followed by, let's say, a mixture of both SMB and, F and NFS. So for this one, the protocol isn't as important. Uh, for NFS, we go back to the question about the, the log devices we did before. But in general, what's going to determine your VDEV layout here will be more the number of clients that are going to access it at the same time and the size of the files you're going to be accessing. If you have a small number of users, maybe five to ten, and if you're accessing large files uh, sequentially for content creation, like if you're pulling in uh, large banks of photos or doing video editing um, locally and not doing it directly off the NAS, uh, RAID Z2 is going to be a fit there because you're going to get good sequential read and write performance. You have that uh, double disk failure tolerance and you got a good level of space efficiency when you go for large files like that. But if you're looking at having more than a dozen users, if you're dealing with lots of really small files, let's say you have a, a GitHub repo for a small development studio, game dev. Uh, they're dealing with lots of files that are only a couple kilobytes. That's mm -hmm. where you're going to be looking at mirrors because you're going to get the random access benefits. Um, each of those mirrors can be serving a different read or a write request at a time. So when you're serving those tiny little files that are a couple of K each, you could have uh, all of those dozen users hitting a different file and each of your mirrors are gonna be able to serve a portion of that. So then if you were to, what would you recommend for a high random read write deployment then? I would definitely say mirrors in this case. Um, okay. You might be able to get away with a really narrow RAID Z, but generally speaking for most users, uh, if you can sort of, I say, uh, stomach the 50% space efficiency overhead of mirrors, um, mm -hmm. then mirrors are definitely the winner here because you get those, uh, if you're looking at say a 12 drive system like our Mini R, if you arrange it in six two drive mirrors, then you're gonna have six sort of concurrent read write requests being able to be queued up. Versus if you did it as RAID Z2 with two six drive RAID Zs, you're only looking at two concurrent read write requests. Okay, and then, so what would you say for a, you know iSCSI SAN style virtualization backend kind of approach? Yeah, SAN style virtualization is going to fall under a lot of those same things with random IO. Um, if you only had one particular target using it, if you're doing uh, iSCSI as a Veeam or some other backup target, um, then maybe you get away with RAID Z2. But in general, as soon as you put more than one or two VMs on there, they start hitting what's called the IO blender, basically concurrent sequential access, 
concurrent sequential access turns into random I.O. Um, mm -hmm. So you're going to want to use mirrors for your VDEVs for the most part. And you're definitely going to want a dedicated high performance log device if you're doing virtualization, whether it's over iSCSI or NFS, because you want to flip on synchronous writes and say, I'm going to guarantee that every single bit that comes from one of my guest machines is going to be committed and stored safely. So that's where you need your high performance log device and you want probably pool disks and mirrors. That does it for my questions. I think the next thing is, do you have any anything you'd like to add to any of these uh in any, any of this? Nothing really outstanding, just that we, we kind of talked specifically about your performance here, uh, specifically on the Mini R, and a lot of, like I said, the performance is going to be limited by the amount of memory in the machine. So somebody who has 16 gigabytes of RAM, they might hit a uh, sort of the, the fact where they're reaching to disk sooner than you would in your Mini R with 64 gigs. Uh, conversely, somebody who's built their own system running on some old data center gear with half a terabyte of RAM, they won't hit that wall until much further down the road. Um, but much of this applies the same to anybody who's running scale or core on compatible hardware. Um, if anybody wants to try it out, again, it's always free. You can go to truenows.com, mm -hmm. grab your copy of scale or core for yourself, um, and keep an eye out for an upcoming evaluation guide. It's going to help you get some hands-on experience in not just scale and core themselves, but a lot of the deeper features and functionality. That's awesome. Chris, thank you again so much. I appreciate you helping set me straight because obviously I had a lot of uh, just assumptions and, and preconceived notions that were clearly not correct when it came to, to caching VDEV. So I, I appreciate that. And I think that uh, these little nuggets of, of knowledge you provide are definitely going to be helpful for others of our viewers who are kind of like trying to figure out what's the right VDEV layout for them because it's it's complicated, right? And if you look at it from a, a top down, it's uh, it can be a little confusing. So I appreciate that very much. No problem, Rich. I'm always happy to talk about uh, ZFS and TrueNAS, and thanks for having me on the show again. So there you have it. My blanket assumption that just adding read and write caches would increase the performance of my transfers was wrong, and that their value really depends on the workloads you're using your NAS for. It's also interesting to learn that for basic SMB network file sharing for a home user, adding read and write caches don't really add any value. And instead of spending money on SSDs for caching, you should spend that money on more RAM for your system. And regarding the best pool layout, generally speaking, for most people, it's going to be just a simple RAID Z2 layout, unless you have workloads that are high in random read writes, or you have a really high user count. And that, friends, will do it for this video. If you found it useful, give it a like or a sub, or if you have a beef with something we said or did, get down those comments and let us know. And now that you finished watching this video, how about checking out some of the other great home lab videos we've done in the past?